This is Jeff Weiss. This is uh, part two of unit one of plant propagation in which I'm going to provide a brief overview and a little bit of history on the subject of uh, plant propagation. So this unit will cover uh, what is plant propagation, a little bit of the history, and um, just a little preview of some of the issues that um, uh, affect the industry and in fact uh, the, the in, in important ways uh, the ability of the whole planet to maintain environmental health and to provide an adequate food supply for our population which recently passed 7 billion people. Uh, what is plant propagation? Plant propagation is uh, the creation of new plants. One or more new plants uh, propagators use a variety of techniques and uh, these plants can be created uh, sexually through seeds or asexually through a variety of different propagules. During this class we're going to talk about a number of techniques. Um, approximately the first third of the class is going to focus on seeds and spores and then um, toward the end of the course we'll get back uh, to talking about techniques for uh, saving and uh, banking uh, seeds. Um, and then in the middle there'll be uh, lessons on uh, other techniques uh, using uh, vegetative materials for um, increasing the number of these plants. Uh, some of the techniques we'll be describing are layering, uh, where uh, plant stems are induced to form new roots and sprouts, uh, division where uh, clumps of plants are taken apart and the uh, individual pieces uh, form new plants. Uh, cuttings, uh, there's a wide variety of different plant tissues that can be used to uh, increase um, the numbers. Uh, grafting and budding where uh, one plant is fused with another uh, to try to capture the best qualities of both of the um, parent plants. Uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, specialized plant structures such as um, bulbs and corms and tubers as a means of propagating plants. We'll even get into uh, a little bit of discussion about micropropagation and tissue culture. And then uh, there's others. So uh, over the course of this uh, semester, we'll provide a survey of all of the uh, major types of techniques used to propagate plants. So there's an important uh, transition from plant breeding to propagation. Uh, plant breeders will create a new plant with uh, desired qualities and the propagators will uh, increase their numbers and try to improve the quality and consistency of those uh, of those uh, uh, specific plants. And a, a new plant might be uh, developed for a variety of uh, desired qualities. Either more fruit or a sweeter taste of fruit such as in these uh, apples. And there are literally hundreds of varieties of apples Plants can be bred for disease resistance, um, flower color or size, uh, plant shape or size, uh, the uh, food content, the size of the seeds, uh, etc. So there's a wide variety of uh, qualities that uh, breeders and propagators try to develop and uh, perpetuate through, um, through their practices. So some of these methods, as I've already suggested, uh, for propagators involve um, new and improved or more desirable plants. And there's various methods of um, delivering the desired results, either through uh, the traditional method of uh, producing hybrids through uh, crossing uh, plants sexually and um, developing and, and selecting seeds. Uh, through all the way through to genetic engineering where um, plant uh, tissue 
uh, plant DNA is bombarded with uh, particles of, of gold or other materials coated with DNA in an effort to introduce new DNA into the uh, target plant DNA and capture uh, new desired qualities in the in the DNA. And then going to uh, uh, the techniques of grafting and budding where um, rootstock materials uh, the material that's growing in the ground is fused with shoot material or scions, the, uh, uh, the parts that produce the foliage and the f uh, flowers and the fruit. Um, that's an important uh, technique, uh, especially used in fruit trees, and we're going to try to do some, uh, some grafting and budding um, during lab sessions in this course. And uh, I think it's worth noting that uh, uh, the, there's a wide variety of, of, of different methods of propagation, um, but that number is uh, expanded dramatically by uh, use of combinations of these techniques. So literally there's uh, almost an infinite variety of different practices that can be used in plant propagation and combinations to achieve the desired results. So um, plant propagation includes both maintaining and preserving the de desired plants and trying to find, uh, uh, continuously trying to find new um, ways of improving and caring for uh, 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 the plants in order to improve their uh, quality, consistency, and their performance in terms of uh, uh, growth, development, um, yields, and the um, uh, number of plants that can be um, produced. So just to take a quick step back in time, um, humans began propagating uh, plants probably more than 10,000 years ago. Um, there was a time before agriculture when hunters and gatherers would go out and collect uh, fruit and seeds from wild growing plants, but it's not too hard to, to imagine that they understood that um, their future ability to gather from those places was probably dependent on seeds getting into the ground and growing. I wonder if they um, realized this and selectively planted um, things, uh, some seeds, or maybe even started propagules in the areas that they were uh, gathering in in order to assure their uh, supply of food the next year. But uh, plant propagation really took off with the growth of civilization. Uh, initially uh, city-states or villages, city-states, and later on kingdoms and empires were all founded upon uh, agriculture and horticulture as the engine of growth. Um, more food was required to support stable populations and uh, as uh, people settled um, a more specialized labor force uh, came into being. Um, the laborers uh, who specialized in uh, agriculture uh, included farmers and peasants and um, uh, some of them had to have been skilled in um, breeding and propagating plants in order to uh, assure that the uh, food supply was going to be adequate to maintain the society. Along with that came development of religion, art, uh, uh, power structures, and wealth in these civilizations, uh, uh, leading uh, to the uh, global society and the seven billion human beings who now in inhabit our, our, our Earth. All of them depend upon uh, uh, agriculture and horticulture and the plants that we produce for food for both humans and for the uh, animals that we eat. So uh, propagation was and still is a key component of our, uh, of our success as a uh, species. Uh, some specific forms of propagation can be traced back uh, thousands of years. For example, um, archaeological um, uh, excavations have um, indicated the types of foods that were grown by um, Native American societies and 
um, Central and South America who propagated corn, potatoes, beans, and melons. Uh, for instance, the remains of these uh, uh, terraces in uh, South America uh, show that advanced uh, methods of uh, agriculture were being practiced by them. There's also uh, evidence that uh, the Chinese developed grafting and layering techniques thousands of years ago so that they were already sophisticated in, in um, understanding how um, uh, plants uh, grow and perform and that uh, the uh, tissues between different plants could unite um, to successfully allow uh, a grafting of one plant on another to occur. And then there's uh, uh, evidence uh, from Roman times that they were very sophisticated in the use of ornamental horticulture. Uh, their uh, gardens and their landscapes were um, uh, developed in a very sophisticated way to support the human um, aspiration to have aesthetically pleasing landscapes using flowers and plantings to um, uh, achieve their artistic um, uh, needs. Now we're fast forwarding to the uh, um, time uh, when Columbus and Captain Cook made their voyages of discovery and this was really the beginning of a global trade in plants and food products. Um, Captain Cook uh, traveled the world and, and um, had uh, botanists uh, aboard his uh, vessels and they brought back uh, ornamental plants and the early colonists brought uh, crop plants such as tomatoes, potatoes, uh, corn beans, uh, sugar cane and the uh, materials to uh, make rum and tobacco products back from the Americas. Uh, tulips and other bulbs were imported from the Middle East. Roses and chrysanthemums from the Far East. So this really uh, began the um, situation that we see today where the plants in our gardens and our farms and our um, uh, even our uh, wild areas uh, come from places all around the world. Fast forward again a little bit to the last 200 years and uh, we will uh, focus on three of my favorite historical figures. Um, the first is Carolus or Carl Linnaeus uh, who was a, uh, a wonderful uh, botanist who uh, developed the um, scientific naming nomenclature, the Latin names that we now use for um, identifying and classifying um, uh, plants. Linnaeus developed the system based on uh, the structure and the number of parts of, uh, of flowers. But his system was so successful uh, that it of course is in use today but it was also expanded to include all of the other organisms, the plants, I'm sorry, the, the animals, the uh, fungi, the uh, uh, microorganisms so that all of the uh, organisms um, on our planet are classified according to the system that Linnaeus originally developed. Uh, next is Charles Darwin whose contributions are incredible uh, based on his voyages in the uh, SS Beagle he studied the uh, the birds in the Galapagos Islands and came up with his uh, theory of evolution. But in addition to that, he made a, other amazing um, uh, discoveries and uh, other theories. Uh, he was uh, he had a farm in, in England and he studied uh, uh, agriculture um, and near the end of his life one of his uh, one of the last papers that he was that he published was on the subject of how earthworms build up uh, soil levels and create uh, uh, layers of new soils. Uh, many of his contemporaries uh, thought he was uh, he was senile when he uh, was studying worms but uh, that paper uh, was 
in some ways uh, one of his most important uh, works that he created during his during a very productive uh, uh, lifetime and finally uh, Gregor Mendel was a little monk uh, tucked away in uh, a remote monastery I think in Russia in the 18 50s and 1860s, and he had a little flower garden uh, where he grew uh, uh, peas, and uh, got interested in uh, in the color of uh, the flowers and the shape of the seeds, and took careful notes, um, uh, and developed uh, the uh, the basis for modern uh, heredity. That is the how uh, traits are uh, passed from one generation to the next. Um, Mendel's notes were uh, tucked away in the monastery from 1866 to 1900 uh, when they were rediscovered, and he was given his just credit for the um, groundbreaking um, work that he did um, uh, now 150 years ago. And fast forward again to the last 50 years, uh, where we could, uh, uh, where we can see the effects of the agricultural revolution. Uh, we are now seeing uh, the massive use of standardized hybrid plants, which are um, where most of our food comes from: uh, uh, corn, wheat, soybeans, and rice produce over 50 percent of the food eaten by. Uh, human beings worldwide. So the advanced breeding and propagation programs that produce the seeds um, for this agricultural revolution are uh, both an important uh, contribution and pose some uh, some uh, issues and risks at the same time. Uh, genetic engineering is a uh, is a reality. Many of the plants uh, breeds that were uh, produce this food were produced through genetic modification. Uh, those plants are called GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. And while they, um, it's true that they produce a vast amount of the food that we eat, um, there are some potential environmental and health risks that are uh, just now beginning to be understood. Um, this field of uh, micropropagation and tissue culture uh, is responsible for a revolution in how um, our ornamental plants and some of our um, horticultural uh, food plants are produced and uh, these areas are all expanding rapidly and offer uh, um, future growth potential and uh, career opportunities uh, for um, plant breeders, plant scientists, and plant propagators. So as uh, suggested earlier there's also uh, for the good that um, this work is done. There's also uh, issues of sustainability and uh, and potential harm to the environment that come with modern plant propagation practices. So genetically modified organisms raise questions about food, food purity, nutrition, um, the heavy reliance on just a few um, varieties of, of plants, both uh, 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 for used uh, for food on our farms and in our gardens um, introduces issues of invasive species uh, and monocultures um, and um, both of these um, can potentially displace native species and local heirloom cultivars uh, which have proven their um, their value as uh, providing environmental services and uh, reliable food so sources for uh, thousands of years. And then there's the uh, another issue that we'll get into on uh, plant patents and uh, uh, copyrights, other uh, protections of the rights of developers to own plants and to restrict their use or to charge large um, fees to um, use seeds or um, cultivars of these plants. So uh, we're going to get into some of this uh, in uh, some of the later units where we talk about seed savers and seed banks 
Um, this uh, lower photograph is a uh, seed vault, also called a doomsday vault, uh, that was built in an abandoned mine on an island uh, north of Norway near the Arctic Circle, uh, where um, uh, seeds of uh, cultivated varieties of plants from around the world are being stored and, and protected uh, in the event of disease uh, or human-caused disaster. and uh, uh, will potentially be available to be used to reintroduce those um, varieties after after such an event. So that is my overview. I'm excited to take this uh, journey with you and we'll continue uh, in further lectures in Unit 2 and I'll look forward to seeing you in the um, in the lab on January 27th.